I want to just talk briefly about PV Grows itself. It's what we call a collaborative network, and the Higher Education Working Group uses that same model. Our specific mission, which we worked hard on crafting, was we are a network of people at the intersection of food systems and institutions of higher education in the Pioneer Valley. And tonight it feels like we're very much at that intersection physically. Like here we are, standing together and interacting. Let's get to the current round of lightning talks. We've been collecting information on Northampton's food and agriculture system as a basis for designing policies to support our farms and increase farm consumer linkages. The project has followed the Keep Farming Blueprint designed by the nonprofit Glenwood Center of New York, as laid out in this wonderful workbook that we've used. And Glenwood representatives have worked with us throughout the project. Most of our students did not grow up on farms, and they know little or nothing. Well, sometimes a little. Sometimes more than a little, but a lot of times very little about farming. But they come inspired about farming as a, a, a career or a life skill that they want to use, and they're eager to get their hands dirty. They spend hours and hours meeting with markets and planning what they're going to grow in the, in the spring, they put to use all the sciences they've studied. They spend many more hours weeding and planting and tending and then harvesting. So a bit about where we came from is last semester the first course in this new uh, farm and food systems program was called Introduction to Food Systems. So that class, that class had three major goals. One goal, study the global food system. Second goal, study the local food system. Third goal, provide some design recommendations to create more health in the, in the local food system. Gleaning is the harvesting of produce after the farmer is done with his or her own harvesting. And the Gleaning Project has been around for five years. So we work with youth groups, church groups, Girl Scouts, um, and also school groups. The kids, they come out and we teach them about where the food is coming from. They get to see firsthand how it's growing. Um, and we also teach them about food security and hunger in their, in their community. The main question of this study is that are there enough acres of farmland in Franklin County to feed to and meet the nutritional needs of Franklin County's projected future population of 77,000 people? So to address this question, Laura and I used a local food shed analysis. So one aspect of the New England Food Food Vision is that it advocates not for a complete um, food self-sufficiency. It advocates for maximizing the local food shed potential of an area, which means that it takes into account um, how much food can be grown and what types of food can be grown on Franklin County's farmland and expands that to not only um, maximize foods that are needed for the population, but that could offer, um, offer the resources needed for the larger region. So I was approached by the UMass Magazine to pull together a group of students and have a project on finding out how to make the perfect apple pie. I went ahead and asked my students, some of my students, if they wanted to join an honors colloquium because I knew it would be, it would be a big task and we would need probably a couple of weeks of lab to do this. We de deconstructed the pie and we devoted a lab to each component. What's wrong with the school, school food? food. <laughs> Here are a few quotes from the Nuestras Raices youth. The pizza is really greasy. I got the pizza one time and it was like meat pizza, but it wasn't real meat. 
It looked like something you'd get from taco meat, but it wasn't. So I ate it, and it was so gross. I saw the cheese pizza, and it was disgusting. It was so gross. You always cut up the meat, and it's like pink. Oh, yeah, the, cheese, the hamburgers, they're brown on the outside and pink inside. And how about that pink slime? But who cares? It's just school food. We, we care. care. <laughs>
The students were involved in the design and implementation of a consumer survey and in processing and analyzing the responses that we got from over 500 city residents. Um, the information, that information is in the final stages of analysis and surveys of food distributors and food providers are now being developed. Um, so taken together, these research efforts are providing the city of Northampton with information it can use to develop policies that can support our local agriculture and its ability to feed our community. Thank you. I'm talking about the UMass Student Farming Enterprise. My name is Ruth Hazard. I'm an extension educator at UMass. UMass has uh, been educating the next generation of farmers since 1867 through two-year and four-year and graduate programs. If you surveyed the, this would be a great study, if you surveyed the farmers, well, the last four generations of farmers in the valley here, you'd find that a lot of them came, graduated from UMass and that, that educational base has formed a backbone of our farmers uh, for quite a long time. And the academic program continues to be strong at UMass. But in, in 2007, I joined forces with some students to, uh, who we all saw a need to revive the practical aspect of farming education at UMass. And along with my co-instructor, Amanda Brown, I started a year-long course with, that gives undergrads real-life experience in planting and growing and marketing vegetables. We grow on certified organic land at the UMass Research Farm in South Deerfield, which you can see at the center there. It's an inspiring place to work. It's located between Sugarloaf and the Connecticut River, has great soils and really good infrastructure for farming. We sell on the UMass campus through a fall CSA, a student businesses, through various student businesses and the campus dining services. I've used what I've learned over 20 years as an extension specialist in vegetables to teach this course and I've learned a huge amount in the process. Most of our students did not grow up on farms and they know little or nothing, well sometimes a little, sometimes more than a little but a lot of times very little, about farming. But they come inspired about farming as a, a, a career or a life skill that they want to use and they're eager to get their hands dirty. They spend hours and hours meeting with markets and planning what they're going to grow in the, in the spring. They put to use all the sciences they've studied. They spend many more hours weeding and planting and tending and then harvesting. They come out at 7 a.m. in the fall all the way through November in the fog and the cold in that beautiful, beautiful place right along the river. And they're always inspired by that. The course has a tendency to take over their lives. Uh, they take ownership and they create something new and bigger every year. So this is now the fifth full year. In 2010, they started a 10-week fall CSA because one of their markets fell apart, they had to sell, so they started a CSA. They had great stuff to sell. Then in 2011, it was a new planting and weeding system, expanding to a 35-member CSA and starting a weekly student farmer's market. This year, they are doubling their production from one to two acres. They're aiming to grow over 17,000 pounds of produce, and they're reaching 10 different markets, mostly right on campus and expanding to a 50-member CSA. We are also working to raise funds for long-term sustainability of the class. So the 2012 class, which is 12 young people, nine women, three men, formulated the following mission statement. As UMass student farmers, we commit to providing our campus community with nutritious, organically grown local produce. We cultivate student empowerment through hands-on agricultural production and by educating our peers about the importance of creating a healthier food system. I love that word, student empowerment. That, to me, that's really, really important part of it. 
But because service learning on, on local farms is also part of our curriculum, these students have a chance to get to know farms around the valley. And graduates are getting jobs from interns, all the way from interns to assistant managers on farms around the Northeast. Some start their own farms, some are working in ag-related nonprofit organizations. So we feel we're cultivating the next generation of farmers as well as cultivating uh, a real live, uh, alive um, group and mission on campus that's educating the campus about sustainable ag. And uh, as you can see, there's our beginning on the upper left that they were growing kale in the fall. Here's where we are now. Kale is one of our signature crops. It's really great in the fall. And um, everybody learns how to drive a tractor. And everybody gets a chance to market. So uh, it's a real exciting experience for all of us. Hi, uh, thanks to UMass and Ruth. So they've been a great inspiration to us, the UMass people. Uh, can I get a hello? Hello. hello? hello. Hello. And would you all be willing to shout out your names on three? Just first name. Everyone shout out your name on three. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. Please forgive me if I don't remember all those, okay? Great. Uh, so, a bit about who I am. I'm Chris. I'm a student in Aber Dresdale's Permaculture Student Forum. And that's a class, the purpose of which is trying to advocate and implement, implement, not implement, a garden at GCC, a permaculture garden at Greenfield Community College. So a bit about where we came from is last semester, the first course in this new uh, Farm and Food Systems program was called Introduction to Food Systems. So that class, that class had three major goals. One goal, study the global food system. Second goal, study the local food system. Third goal, provide some design recommendations to create more health in the, in the local food system. So what did we find? It's a really great question. Talk about the global food system. We found some serious voids and some serious problems some of which you maybe know. Who's, who's familiar? Raise your hand. Who's familiar with the global food system and some of the issues there? Feel free to just call out one. I can say one is like, we use pesticides, big problem. You can call out another. Anyone? Monsanto, farm factory, fossil fuels. Desertification. Desertification. Let's do one more. Contamination of, Contamination of water. The serious issue. So that's what we saw in the global food system. Zoom in. Local food system, we studied specifically, when I say local, I mean Greenfield. Uh, we saw some voids as well. There were some assets, two CSAs in Greenfield. We have a co-op, we have a beautiful co-op in Greenfield, so there's some food community there. But we have voids, right? There's no food education. There's no serious food education in other schools. We now have one at the college, but we didn't have one before. Other voids are uh, lack of skills, lack of knowledge. We also found some assets as well. So just to discuss some assets we found, uh, specifically in Greenfield and at GCC, there's a lot of food professionals. You guys saw Keith and uh, Jonah Niger, permaculture experts. They are both in Greenfield. Land, GCC has over 100 acres of land. So there's like a huge asset that's there. Uh, plants, right, there's a lot of nurseries. There's a lot of people with this kind of knowledge in the valley. Greenhouse, we have a new net zero, zero net energy greenhouse. Uh, there's a compost program that people are trying to get started on our campus. We have Aber Dresdale again. Aber Dresdale has been starting this program and with a lot of energy has been bringing students passion along. So, uh, and an administration that's been really supportive. And we have a 20% food initiative. <laughs> Thanks, Aber. Okay, so, and then we had all these voids. So the, Remember, design recommendations, the question came up is like, we have all these assets here, we've created concentric circles, all these assets, and we have all these voids. So, in our pod system, in the food systems class, we're trying to figure out how to connect, how to connect all these assets that we have and reach all these voids. So the design recommendation became clear through the cultivation pod. We saw UMass had 
created this permaculture garden. How many people know about the UMass permaculture garden? So tons of you. And uh, so we want to model ourselves. So at the end of the class, we form this new class, the class I'm in now, the permaculture, the permaculture student forum, to implement this garden. So we have all these assets. We're going to take them. We're going to plug them into this garden. And then we're, this garden will hopefully, once implemented, if that's happening, we're advocating now, will fill all these voids, right? The, uh, you know, food desert issues and the skill issues and all these issues that we have in our community. And I see that happening with permaculture. It's like that garden that they've created, excuse me, UMass, that garden they created is filling, it's helping to fill all these voids. So it's a really special initiative that we have, that we've modeled after them. 30 seconds. Okay, so... Um, just quickly is we had our shred yesterday. Shred is an open forum where people can come and share their ideas. And it was really successful. It was like vibrantly successful. People came, they were passionate, they shared designs, they shared ideas. So, and the next step is we're going to have a final presentation. It's up there May 15th, 1 to 2 p.m. And this program continues. Right? So, people you know who are interested in food issues, let them know Greenfield Community College has this budding and vibrant food program. It's, like, it's really fun. It's really educational. It's really supportive. So, that's one thing that's going on. And also, we have this permaculture garden. We really want people to engage. We really want people to share their wisdom, to come and participate, to learn from the garden uh, once and if we get it implemented. So, uh, one more thing before I leave is do this with your local schools. It's been so much fun. We've been building community. It's been challenging us. You know, that's, that's a big thing when we move forward in food issues is we're going to have to fight through these challenges. So, uh, so move forward. Help us. Help your communities. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I am Jessica Harwood, and I am the gleaning coordinator at Rachel's Table. Um, gleaning is the harvesting of produce after the farmer is done with his or her own harvesting. And the gleaning project has been around for five years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, um, tell you what we've done, and tell you what our hopes for next steps are and the connection to higher education. Um, so gleaning exists because 40% of the food get that is produced in the United States goes to waste, and it goes to waste for a variety of reasons. Um, the farmers that we work with donate the food that they have in extra for, for reasons sometimes just because they're being generous. Um, they also donate food that's slightly imperfect. So we were donated 40 cases of peppers um, that were small, but perfectly edible. Um, they were ripe at the same time that peppers in Florida were ripe that were twice as big, so they couldn't sell them to the major grocery stores. Um, we also get food from CSAs because the farmers plant enough, that they, enough for what they'll need for all their members, which means that they generally plant more so they can make sure that everyone gets what they need. Um, so in Massachusetts, 20% of households with children are food insecure. In Western Mass, um, a recent study found that the agencies that receive food donations from the food bank um, have had an increase in 22% in the number of people coming to them looking for food. And the food service agencies that we work with, with the Gleaning Project, have all found an increase in the number of clients coming to the pantries or coming to get meals. Um, so what we do is generally to work with students as volunteers. Um, we work with Will Snyder's class, which is a community service learning class dealing with hunger and food issues. Um, but we also work a lot with younger children. So we work with youth groups, church groups, Girl Scouts, um, and also school groups. Um, just give you some ideas of what the experience is like for the kids. They come out and we teach them about where the food is coming from. They get to see firsthand how it's growing. Um, and we also teach them about food security and hunger in their, in their community. Um, and we were harvesting lettuce at one farm in Deerfield, and there were dark brown spots on the outside leaves. And the volunteers and I were pulling off the outside leaves to find these perfect heads of lettuce. Um, and we filled up all of the containers and harvested probably 
I don't know, about 300 pounds of lettuce, which is a lot of lettuce, if you can imagine how much one head of lettuce is. Um, and the middle schoolers that I was gleaning with were so upset that there was still one full row of this lettuce, um, and they wanted to just fill the school bus as much as they could with the lettuce. Um, we also work with the Martin Luther King Charter School in Springfield and have gleaned apples with them for the last four years. And the, a lot of the students that we work with have never had the chance to go apple picking or have never even left Springfield. Um, and they really get very excited about the opportunity to fill their bags with apples and then bring them to donation. Um, so we've harvested over 45,000 pounds in the last five years and worked with over 1,000 volunteers. Um, and what we do with the volunteers once we harvest the food is to take it directly to the food service agency so it gets used right away, either for a meal or to give away at a pantry. Um, and we've brought watermelons or apples to the Northampton Survival Center or to Loaves and Fishes and people get very excited when they see this fresh food. Um, the agencies that we donate to don't get a lot of fresh food. They very rarely get local food and almost never get organic food. Um, so we're sort of closing that gap in this community of taking the food that's already existing and um, giving it to the food service agencies. Uh, one director of an agency in Holyoke told us about how we donated a lot of peppers and she could smell in the community for the next few days sofrito cooking because people don't usually have the peppers to make it. Um, so as far as next steps, we want to continue what we're doing. Um, we want to work hopefully with more farms and with more volunteer groups. Um, but working with the farmers is definitely the hardest part as far as making sure that um, we're being respectful of their land and um, their needs as farmers. So we're hoping to start working hope with college volunteers to be the coordinators with certain farms so that they can be volunteering regularly on the farms um, and then know when there's extra produce that's available for gleaning. Um, we're also excited to have um, any members of the community who are interested in being involved with gleaning be on call to, um, to be ready to glean at a moment's notice because a lot of times there is extra that the farmers have but are ready to till, till that land under to plant a new thing. Um, so we're welcome to any other ideas and we're excited to have other people get involved too. So thank you. So we're students at the Conway School and one unique aspect of the Conway School is that it allows students like us to work on real projects for real clients that might have an impact on the local food system. And I'm here to tell you about one of those projects, the farmland and food shed study that we're conducting on behalf of the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. So this is one, an, one preliminary step in a larger food shed um, assessment and it will inform FERCOG's um, regional plan for sustainable development. The main question of this study is that are there enough acres of farmland in Franklin County to feed to and meet the nutritional needs of Franklin County's projected future population of 77,000 people? So to address this question, Laura and I used a local food shed analysis. There are many models of food shed analyses out there based on different diets and based on different regions, but we, um, we applied a food shed analysis known as the New England Good Food Vision. And um, so assuming this diet, this model, this analysis, the New England Good Food Vision assumes um, the use of sustainable agriculture and it also um, assumes a diet that is based exclusively upon foods that can be grown in New England. Um, and the local food analysis indicates that 33,000 acres of farmland would be needed to meet Franklin County's residents' nutritional needs. Using geospatial analysis, we um, looked at the amount of farmland that is currently in production in Franklin County and found it to be 37,000 acres. So the takeaway is that there is enough farmland in Franklin County for Franklin County to be completely food self-sufficient. However, this would only leave about 4% of the farmland that could contribute to a regional food system. 
So although Franklin County could be completely food, food self-sufficient, whether, um, whether or not they would want to be is a choice that they have to make. So one aspect of the New England Food Food Vision is that it advocates not for complete um, food self-sufficiency. It advocates for maximizing the local food shed potential of an area, which means that it takes into account um, how much food can be grown and what types of food can be grown on Franklin County's farmland and expands that to not only um, maximize foods that are needed for the population, but that could offer, um, offer the resources needed for the larger region um, for um, the, local, the regional food system. So one thing that we looked at in our study was to compare um, what it would look like to pursue um, complete self-sufficiency in Franklin County versus looking at a more um, regionally oriented um, food system. One aspect of our study was also to consider um, protection of farmland and this model suggests that Franklin County has a lot of agricultural resources that could be prioritized for protection and the question may be how might um, farmland protection support increased um, food support the local food system or the potential for local food. So taking a step back, the implications of our study also show that Franklin County may have a greater economic and other um, advantages when pursuing a regional model um, or looking at increasing food production um, which supports a regional um, food system as opposed to a more local self-sufficient one. Franklin County um, may have enough um, farmland to um, export foods that are needed for um, the Boston metro areas and other larger populations that don't have the land resources to grow their own foods while also being able to grow about enough food to meet about 80% of Franklin County's um, projected population's nutritional needs. So this is really interesting information which can be a conversation starter and which can suggest the importance of the protection of farmland and the value of farmland in Franklin County. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Kinney, and I'm food, surface, uh, food service faculty in, oh, sorry, <laughs> in the Department of Hospitality and Tourism. Uh, and we have a brand new facility on the, uh, what used to be called the top of the campus, of the campus center. Now we call it the Marriott Center due to a large donation from the Marriotts. We have really beautiful kitchens. It's, it's a dream come true for me. So I teach food labs there. I'm the culinary professional and our students are in our department are required to take a introductory food course and it is a how to learn how to cook course. So I was approached by the UMass magazine to pull together a group of students and have a project on finding out how to make the perfect apple pie. I went ahead and asked my students, some of my students, if they wanted to join an honors colloquium because I knew it would be, it would be a big task and we would need probably a couple of weeks of lab to do this. We de deconstructed the pie and we devoted a lab to each component, starting off with the crust. So each student experimented with different recipes in various amounts of all-purpose flour or 100% whole wheat or a mixture thereof and then working with different fats all butter, all shortening, which is Crisco, or lard, and then combinations. So we, we rolled them out, we baked the crusts, and then the students tasted them. We had judging, so they judged, and based on everything, all the samples, they chose the one with the best flavor, and flakiness is a big key for a good crust. 
And so the winner of that one was the one that was butter lard. <laughs> lard makes the flakiness, butter makes the flavor. So our next lab, we chose to concentrate on what we would use for the uh, filling, not the apples, but what's going to go around the apples. So the students now had their crust, so I had them each make their own pies, and we chose just one apple for everyone to use because that was not what we were judging. And uh, so we had um, Cortland's. We used Cortland's. And probably the thing that was the most exciting for me was that the uh, UMass Orchard donated apples for us for this whole project and just, just to have as many apples as I wanted that of all these varieties was just amazing to me. So, but for this one we just kept it to Cortland and so we started off, we had the very basic one, the one I've been making for years and that is with just uh, lemon juice, cinnamon, flour and a little salt but then we tried it with brown sugar, we tried it with apple butter, with um, reduced apple cider, and different spices. The students did the judging. I have to tell you, they like things on the sweet side. So they chose the one with the addition of the brown sugar, so that was what we used. Then the last one was putting it all together, but now with different apples. So from the Cold Spring Orchard, what we had was Cortland, Baldwin, Northern Spy, Spy Gold, Jana Gold, Golden Delicious, Sun Crisp, and Iderad, Iderad. So each of the students made two pies using each of those apples, and for this we did bring in outside judges. So for that, our judging was scales of one to five for firmness, tartness, sweetness, flavor, appearance, and juiciness, judging these apples. The judges came in and they judged and as I heard them talking, I realized I made a big mistake because I labeled the pies. It should have been a blind study. And I just didn't realize in this area, people love their Cortlands. They're very <laughs> devoted to them and it skewed the judging. So that was the winner. So all I can do is add what my personal favorites were. <laughs> I love the Golden Delicious and it did change my pie making for Thanksgiving and I think now what it has brought to me is more experimentation with apples. So my favorites are Cortland, Golden Delicious and Sun Crisp together and I wowed my Thanksgiving guests with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
This is significant because it provides the historic backdrop for what is now the modern local food movement and it, it provides the history for the Heritage Frame. The Heritage Frame encourages people to eat and grow local food because it exhibits self-sufficiency and independence, which are very American and patriotic values. It exhibits community pride, state pride, family pride, and even individual pride. For example, popular activist Michael Pollan insists that we have, that we have to be reintroduced to our food. His best-selling book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, which you may be familiar with, was entirely focused on how out of touch we are, with a, out of touch our society is with our food system and the way our food is produced. The point of the book is that we must return to our roots in order to get back in touch with our food. He goes all the way back to hunter-gatherer methods of collecting food, and through that he recognizes how complicated our society's relationship to food has become, and it is so, because it is so um, involved in the agribusiness. The heritage frame, I believe, also extends to heirloom fruits and vegetables. You can look around and see that many farms in many areas of the country are striving to return to what was historically grown in that area. For example, in the Republican this, this September, um, it reports how New England was once the booming center of wheat production in colonial times, but during the 1800s, wheat production moved out to the Midwest, where we all know it remains today as the agribusiness culture we all know and love. Now, there's a movement to increase the production of and reliance on local wheat grown in the Pioneer Valley in local towns such as Northfield and Gilmass. These farms are actively participating in this heritage frame by literally producing historic food that was once grown here. It's important for all of us to note that the heritage frame that I'm talking about here is just one way of understanding the social movement. The alternative food movement and the local food movement are extremely diverse and multifaceted and have many levels of membership and involvement, as is wonderfully represented here at this event tonight. All of these issues are intimately connected and can be expressed in the famous words of John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Thank you. What's wrong with the school, school food? food. <laughs> Here are a few quotes from the Nuestras Raices youth. The pizza is really greasy. I got the pizza one time and it was like meat pizza, but it wasn't real meat. It looked like something you'd get from taco meat, but it wasn't. So I ate it and it was so gross. <laughs> I saw the cheese pizza and it was disgusting. It was so gross. You always cut up the meat and it's like pink. Oh yeah, the, cheese, the hamburgers, they're brown on the outside and pink inside. And how about that pink slime? But who cares? It's just school food. We, we care. care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the Nuestra Saizas Youth Group in Holyoke. We are working together with the UMass team to study and change school food. Why? Why? <laughs> the youth group decided to focus on school food because it is such an important resource for children and youth in Holyoke. And about half of the student population participates in the lunchroom. Over 75% of the 5,900 students in Holyoke Public Schools are from low-income households eligible for free and reduced price. And 70% of those students identify themselves as Latino. So what did we do? We wanted to learn where cafeteria food comes from and what happens when youth get active in trying to bring fresh local food into cafeterias. We decided on the photo voice method because it's a great way to get youth involved in research. In photo voice, Community members take pictures documenting issues, and then we look at the photos together to generate discussion about what matters most. At the end of the project, we share the photos with the wider community and policymakers in a photo exhibition. For this project, some youth received cameras and took photos of each link in the school food chain, where food grows, transporting and storing food, preparing food in the school kitchens, and eating lunch in the cafeteria. We especially wanted to learn what it takes to bring food grown in Holyoke Farms to school cafeterias only one or two miles down the road. So what did we learn? School cafeterias produce thousands of meals, and a lot of the food is processed and comes from far away. We learned that there are lots of rules that school food services have to deal with every day. We learned that there is fresh food grown in Holyoke, and food service managers can be allies in the fight for the soul of school food. There have been some successes in bringing veggies from La Finca to Holyoke Public Schools, and we should help this grow. 
But students won't get better food unless we, the youth, have the chance to taste and learn to like new foods and... Youth voices need to be heard by people who make policies about school food. We showed our pictures to the Holyoke School Committee and they were making important decisions about the future of school food. We learned that it takes time to get the attention of decision makers. So where are we going now? At the end of the project, we held a feast and photo exhibition and invited people from the community, the health center, schools, and newspapers. We shared a local food meal with them and talked about food, school food. And that was that. Or so it seems. A few months later, the new food service director started to meet with the youth. The Holyoke Schools just started a Puerto Rican Carnival Food Day, and it was great. Some of us traveled to school food conferences in Detroit and Oakland to talk about our project. And now we are working as a group to write up an article for a community development journal. And then Nuestras Raices Youth will continue to do work on school food issues. We would love to talk to you more about our project, show you our photos, and come visit us at our corner. Thank you. <laughs>